Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to the briefing room. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh, recording from the road. A little bit interesting today, but we have a fantastic conversation and presentation lined up for you about the unreasonable efficiency of streaming graph. We're going to be hearing from Ryan Wright of that dot. And also we have a very special guest. Our analyst today is Mark Lind. Mark is one of the top five cybersecurity experts in the world, I hear, which is pretty impressive stuff. And we've been chit-chatting before the show, and he knows a tremendous amount about what's actually happening out there and what you can do about it. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Ryan Wright. He'll give about a 20, 25-minute presentation and demo, and then Mark will dive in with questions. And folks, don't be shy. Ask questions at any time, which you can do using the Q&A or the chat window. With that, Ryan Wright of that dot, take it away. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to talk with you this morning. Um, so at that dot, we've been working for quite some time, actually, to create kind of an unfair advantage for the cybersecurity community. Um, it's it's often been said that uh, defenders think in lists, but attackers think in graphs. And as long as that remains true, the attackers are going to win. So we're here to change that dynamic uh, and bring graphs, especially throughout the real-time data processing world for the cybersecurity community. Graphs have been around for a while, but the key challenge is that they usually live very much at the end of a data pipeline. So data gets ingested and processed, and that data is the precious source of answers for cybersecurity questions because it's it's the logs of what's happening in real time. It goes through a, a pipeline to be processed and stored and uh, transformed and, uh, and interpreted. And through that whole process, it ad adds time and latency and eventually you can get to the end of the process and then there's some uh, common tools available at the very end to do entity resolution and find the anomalies that are in that data stream. Um, but that data stream then is significantly delayed, often by hours, if not more. Hours, sometimes days old data that finally gets analyzed and processed. And the industry often finds themselves in a place where they're describing what did happen in the past. Uh, and that's a far a far place from where we want to be uh, in the, the real-time reaction in the cybersecurity world. So what that dot is doing is we've spent almost 10 years now working on some new technology that, that will take this data processing at the end of the stream and really move it up move it earlier in the stream so that those deep questions that can only typically be answered at the very end after lots of data has been processed, those can become answers in real time, a part of the stream. So while data is flowing, while it's coming in, you can understand what that data means, do entity resolution and anomaly detection to find what is strange, what should you be paying attention to, and get those answers in real time, in seconds or less, <clears throat> so that those answers are available to trigger other systems, to alert humans, or so that some of those answers can help be used in for the sake of prioritizing what to look at and drawing human attention where it needs to be. And a key part of some of the capabilities that uh, that dot has been developing it can even take this a step further to instead of just being back in the server farm doing processing in as part of the data pipeline, because of the low resource usage for some of what we're talking about here today, you can actually even push this a step further and deploy this at the edge. And so doing early cybersecurity threat detection, smart data filtering out at the edge um, where you're initially collecting that data can really cut the time to answer and bring those answers much, much earlier uh, in the data pipeline. So that's the key capability uh, behind uh, the technology and the products being developed at that dot. Um, we, we actually go under two different product names for what we've done. Streaming graphs are really the starting point for our conversation today. The streaming graph is like a graph database, but we really don't use this database term. It does store data, but the key point, as we were mentioning, is in the pipeline, in the stream of data, do that graph reasoning and that graph analysis. 
So use it to detect complex patterns that help you find the signal in the noise and filter out that low value data. The second piece of the puzzle, using the streaming graph, we built a new AI capability uh, that we call that dot novelty. It will watch a stream of data and find what's unusual in that stream of data uh, and tell you what you should be focusing on with a ranking for how unusual it is compared to everything else and an explanation for why. Finding those unknown unknowns in the data set is the second piece of the puzzle. So the way we do this with streaming graph is that data streams in uh, from the typical sources where it's commonly being caught and captured and begun to be processed. Data streams in um, and immediately it can be used to build a graph. And that, that graph lets us understand the relationships between data. So instead of just being logged in a table where you could come back and query it if you knew where to go and what to look, uh, and you could do lots of processing to join different tables together, the data in the graph gives us the connections. It tells us what else is nearby that's important. What else should we be paying attention to? And the graphs have long been used in cybersecurity applications, but they've been known to be kind of slow and good for small offline toy problems at the end of a data pipeline. Um, but with that dot streaming graph, we actually bring that graph driven reasoning uh, into the real time nature of event driven graph processing in the stream. So it's meant to complement the AI applications that are being used. Uh, further downstream, help prepare their data, help clean their data, help find and focus the attention and the training phase so that those systems can be more effective at what they do. There's a lot of deep technical problems in doing this, like handling data that arrives out of order uh, because you're processing highly parallel, data is going to arrive out of order. Um, Doing away with the time window band-aid that a lot of data teams have been managing where you can process data if everything you care about arrives within a certain time window. That's a limitation that is artificial, but it's been the only way the industry has been able to limp by for a long time. If you're looking for a pattern and that pattern is spread out in time and that time it's larger than your time windows, then it causes data loss. It causes you to miss results. And it's why you can't find key attacks that are being performed on the systems right now. And so with a streaming graph, we bring the ability to bear that can eliminate that perspective, that need for time windowing, and actually combine all the data together, connect it together, connect those dots so that you can see the bigger picture, um, and flex with the data sources that you have now and the next data sources that you need to add uh, as time goes on. The, I mentioned the key piece of this puzzle is really about speed. The challenge for working with graphs has really always been that they're neat, they're useful, and they're powerful, but they're far too slow to actually be used in production in high volume situations. And so uh, the team at that dot I mentioned has been working for quite some time, uh, and we've been fortunate enough to be sponsored by uh, by DARPA in the early days of the research uh, of this work in order to really scale graphs for real and to solve this problem in ways that brings new capabilities to the market. And so that scaling challenge has limited the use of graphs and they've been somewhat relegated to the end of data pipelines. But what I'm showing here on this slide is actually just some, some technical details uh, that you can find down at a link below about how real world use case that had to scale beyond the hundreds or thousands of events per second that graphs are typically known for. It had to go past a million events per second. And the system for that process is it has to remain stable like all these other data pipeline systems that you require and rely on for real-time updates. And so uh, our team has cracked this nut and delivered streaming graph computation at scale uh, that can go well beyond the limitations of any other system to provide real-time graph analysis uh, for cybersecurity data in real time. The applications go in so many different directions, um, but XDR in the cybersecurity world is a key, 
a key application for this. And so many other, uh, other kinds of challenges in real-time data streams end up as a view on the cybersecurity world or a different form uh, of cybersecurity challenges being faced by enterprises today. Whether you're trying to figure out what went wrong with systems and the challenges to get to that root cause, whether you need to put a whole lot of pieces together about attempts to authenticate to a system and detect that there's actually uh, there's actually a malicious actor operating on a part of your IT infrastructure and the signal is in their authentication attempts, um, monitoring cloud infrastructure to see what, el what else is happening that shouldn't be happening in that environment, or even insider threat detection uh, to be able to find suspicious uh, activity being done by people who are supposed to have access. Credential theft is one of the hard problems where an attacker's goal is to gain legitimate access. And their favorite way to do this is to steal the credentials of somebody who's authorized. And now that those credentials are allowed to go uh, attack or access other parts of the system. Uh, and so detecting that has often been a challenge. And all these things now can be solved by putting the pieces together in a real-time data stream uh, in real time uh, with, with streaming graph. So the challenge here, um, you know, as, as we've hinted at, graphs have been around for a while. And you might say, hey, but wait, graphs are slow. You know, we can't really scale them. They can't go beyond what it can do. We already looked at a little bit of uh, a reference to some of the deep scaling capabilities that DOT has been able to achieve with streaming graphs. Um, but why? What, is, what has been the obstacle here? And the real challenge has been uh, when you try to combine two different aspects of what we care about. It really, what we want is we want fast data analysis and answers to deep questions. The combination of those two things is usually a trade-off that has to be made. So to understand where the attacker is or what's the malicious activity happening in your system, you have to process it fast. Otherwise, the best you can do is report on what the attacker stole or here's what they did. But if you have any hope of stopping a bad guy, uh, then you need this deeper analysis that can actually put the pieces together and actually understand why uh, this one particular event, say a process reading a file on a computer over in the corner, why that is actually the last piece of the puzzle for seeing the smoking gun for the bad guy's activity. That is a deep question. It relies on combining real-time data with what has happened historically in the past, potentially weeks, months, even years back into the past. Because attackers have learned that if you've got a little time window that you can analyze, maybe it's an hour, maybe it's a day, maybe it's a week. But if there's a time window, all the attacker has to do is spread out their attack beyond that time window. And then there's too much data for you to process and you'll never be able to catch up to them. And so the key piece of the puzzle that uh, that dot has solved is taking this deep processing for deep answers combining it with real-time streaming uh, capabilities to be able to put a graph in the stream. So plugging it into Kafka, plugging it into the sources of data that actually are collecting the, the raw logs from your enterprise environment, using that to build up a graph and then monitoring that graph live and in real time so that patterns in that graph can be found immediately, can be streamed out without a human having to go query them, can be streamed out down to the systems that need to handle them and the analysts who need to take action. That is the key capability of a streaming graph, that it can monitor the connected data that's being built from live streams and turn it into a new capability about when something is happening that you need to pay attention to. We know the what, we're trying to find the who, we're trying to get to a why. All these question words are a key piece of understanding the, uh, this, the attacker's activity in a system. What has been the, the important missing piece of the puzzle is when. 
So with that dot streaming graph, we can build, bring this deep capability to answer in deeply insightful questions to real time and push out notifications that can finally tell an end user when. Now, because a picture is worth a thousand words, uh, I think a demo is probably worth a thousand pictures. So let me pause with the slides here for a moment um, and pull up a live example. So here we're looking at that dot website and that dot is the sponsors of the Quine open source website uh, and the Quine open source project. Um, Quine uh, is an, a freely available version of the open open or the streaming graph uh, that you can try on your own. You can experiment with solving problems in real time. Um, and th that dot supports scaling this capability to endless data volumes. But Quine is a great place to get started uh, because you can run everything that I'm about to show you and you can experiment with how it works with your data and in your environment just by downloading the executable here, download this jar file, and then take a look at the recipes. Recipes are a package of configuration and that package defines how it's going to be used. And that's the demo that I'm gonna run for you right now. In particular, let's look at a really hard cybersecurity problem. So here's APT detection. An APT is an advanced persistent threat. This is about the a sophisticated attacker who is live and inside the enterprise environment already. They're past your defenses, they're through the walls. Now they're hiding out inside the castle basement. Um, they know what they're doing. They're extremely well-funded and this, kind of has a status of being uh, full of despair in that most enterprise CISOs and cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity concerned uh, leaders um, kind of give up in the face of an advanced persistent threat. But there's been a huge rise recently in this kind of activity, and especially in just the disruption capabilities that come from this. And being able to find an advanced persistent threat who's been in there for a while was impossible and now becomes automatic. Let me show you what this looks like. So here in the purple is, you don't have to read and understand this, but it's just the text of the configuration we're gonna run. We're gonna ingest from two different sources and this will run just on locally here on my laptop, but this uh, uh, can also plug into live Kafka services, uh, or Kinesis or other sources of data. It can run in an enterprise environment. It can even run forward deployed on the edge. But two different sources of data. One of these is gonna be endpoint data, um, like what's happening on an endpoint in the enterprise environment about what processes are running, what files do they access, um, what kind of network activity is sent and received from that machine. We're gonna combine it together in kind of an XDR approach with a different data set. Uh, network data. This network data is like flow data. It's what you might see from routers and other network devices. Combining those two things together can be used to build a connected graph where we can understand all the activity. And I'm going to show you a picture of this instead of walking through the, uh, the text of it. Um, but behind the scenes, there's running something that we call a standing query. That standing query, it continuously monitors for patterns in the graph. In this case, for indicators that there's something suspicious going on. And those indicators can draw our attention in real time. They can focus human analysts. Um, they can trigger downstream systems. So let me go ahead and run this recipe. And as it starts up, it's gonna start ingesting uh, data so you see those counters probably very tiny down at the bottom, um, but don't worry too much about that. What we're really going to look at here um, is in the exploration UI, take a look at some data. We've got some file activity. So here's a process number 7496 that re wrote to a file over here. This is synthetic data, by the way, but it's based on a true story. We've also got another process that had some network activity. And each of these things ends up being highly connected. 
Uh, there's other activity happening under the hood for reading that file, writing that file, uh, all the other activity that was done by a process. And so each of these is ingested as simple data, but it gets connected into a graph in real time. And I don't know if you caught it, but while I was talking here, we got a notification down at the bottom of the screen. Um, our standing query has found something and I can copy the URL uh, that was printed out from what was found. Let's go take a look. And right here, we can see what it was pointing at. So this is activity that we had uh, just generally speaking said to find, find something like this that's suspicious in the data and notify me in real time. In this case, our notification took the form of uh, uh, printing out to the to the console down at the bottom there. Um, but it could also trigger Slack. It can post to downstream systems and do so much more. But the pattern we were looking for is actually this, what's in this box right here. This is a process, in this case, Excel, Microsoft Excel that wrote to a temporary file. No big deal there. Uh, Excel writes to temporary files all the time. All right, and then also there's another process called ntclean. It read from a temporary file and deleted a temporary file. Both those things happen all the time. So processes read and write to temporary files all the time, no big deal. What's special about this is that they wrote to, read from, and deleted that same file. That file became a channel of communication between Excel and this ntclean process. So let's look a little bit further and understand what's happening here. Well, the file is read by Excel. We've got a spreadsheet that came in uh, through email. And in this case, must have contained a malicious macro because that spreadsheet caused Microsoft Excel to read the user's private plans. Reading those private plans is the data that went into this temp file. That temp file was picked up later by this NT clean process. Well, what? and then sent out the network. So the private plans from the user's document just went out the network once we put these pieces together. We can see that. So where did NT clean come from? Well, this process was started by another process, SSH. That's a remote access process that is commonly running on servers and uh, desktops all over the place. Um, but in this case, there must have been a vulnerability because it receives some data on a local port. That, that connection came from an external IP. And now we can see exactly where it came from, this 171.117 address. So an incoming connection through SSH is what started this NT clean process. It sat there just waiting until a spear phishing attack caused Excel to copy the user's private plans and write them into a temporary file. Then the APT picked up that temporary file and exfiltrated it. It exfiltrated it out from this local IP address to an external IP address at, wait a minute, that IP address is the same. Here's the smoking gun. We just watched an APT that got in early through a remote connection, nothing necessarily suspicious about that, uh, those kind of connections happen all the time, but a process made an external connection, causing it to spawn this NT clean process that sat and waited. It waited quietly until a spear phishing attack dropped a payload for it to pick up. It picked up that payload and sent it back out to the attackers who originally infiltrated through that network. This sort of uh, pattern built up in a graph and understood in just a minute or two gets buried under a mountain of other data. If it was only this that we had to look for and only this that we had to understand, well, it'd be as easy as we just saw. But the fact that this is buried in a huge mountain of data makes this an impossible task uh, for most enterprise environments. And so it becomes the sort of thing that only much, much, much later after the end of your data pipeline has finished churning through uh, a, a lot of detailed analysis on this, could you actually find that in this piece of the puzzle, this is what really mattered and really signified something suspicious that you should take action on and monitor immediately. 
So being able to find those pieces when they're buried in a mountain of data has been the big challenge uh, and a, has been a big obstacle that is now uh, overcome with that dot streaming graph. Putting a graph in the real-time data pipeline to be able to connect the dots, put the pieces together, monitor them live in complex ways to answer deep questions and stream those answers out so that we can take action immediately. That's hey, the Gordon. unreasonable effectiveness of a yeah. streaming graph in the enterprise data pipeline. It is an Thank unfair you. advantage in the cybersecurity world. Yeah, sorry, Ryan, real quick. Um, are you capturing all that data from the network or do you deploy in other places? I mean, if you can read what Excel is doing, for example, is that coming through the network or where do you get that data? Yeah, that's typically uh, endpoint data that is uh, collected in, in this case, something like a monitoring agent um, that most cybersecurity applications would deploy uh, to collect that inside information about what is a computer doing. Um, and they would collect it and oftentimes stream it out to be analyzed um, by another external system. Oh, I see. That is absolutely fascinating. Well, Mark Lind, uh, chime in and ask any questions you want. I thought that was a fantastic demo. And it was really fun watching the graph get put together. And I love the way you were showing the different component parts and the steps and how you can kind of piece together. Wait a second. Why is this happening and why is that happening? But Mark, I'll hand it over to you. Take it away. Yeah, no, I think a couple of things uh, stood out for me. I was thinking about some of the potential applications that we're hearing customers um, and manufacturers and others talk about, right? Uh, like, what, what if, if I could do that? And, and one of those examples, you know, was one of the ones that Ryan just gave. Uh, that, that's a really good one because uh, going in and it was almost like live forensics, if you will, because we were able to delve in there and make some determinations quickly where that can often take uh, days, if not longer, which, you know, in some cases, insurance company won't even let you do anything if you're insured until after the forensics have been determined. And that that is a big issue because your 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 applications are impacted. So that, so it definitely I see a very high value around um, the uh, the demo that uh, that he gave. Um, the a couple other items leaped off the page for me though. Um, you know, I was thinking about the uh, threat hunting possibility, which is really kind of an element of what we did right there, right? You're you're, you're threat hunting. You're trying to determine those pieces, but um, I think one of the things was is that a lot of times you have it's historical data written to the database. And then you have to, or the logs, and then you have to go in there and you have to go through that uh, and you're waiting for an alert. In this particular case, Ryan, we're not waiting for an alert, right? I mean, there's some significant advantages to not doing that. Yeah, that's actually a great point in that the, uh, you know, what, what we saw there was kind of a laser focus on what matters and being and seeing the exact moment when it happened, like while live while data is ingesting. But a lot of times, some of the key capability uh, for what's realized, let me bounce around a few slides here too, is uh, thinking of that streaming graph inside a data pipeline to be able to pull in data from sources and push out data to other streaming sources or other downstream systems. Um, there's also this subtle capability that unlocks huge potential and it's this little arrow just top right of center here. When results are found in a streaming graph, they could go out to external systems or they could call back into the graph. Um, they can enrich the data. They can process the data. They can connect other data. They can make uh, requests to other systems to pull in other pieces of that puzzle. And this becomes a hugely powerful capability um, for running some some important algorithms or important processing live and in, in the stream. It gets triggered by data patterns. So when data matches certain patterns, it can then call back in and update the patterns uh, subsequently. So connect more data and enrich that data, process that data, or continue running an algorithm that then helps you take action, helps you more deeply understand what's really happening, uh, and that that capability is really the bedrock foundation for so many uh, of the applications under the hood uh, that become just game changers for for something like understanding uh, 
understanding, you know, attack paths in, in the real world. So how an attacker is moving through an enterprise environment, or even just evaluating your assets and understanding which of them is the most important. Uh, well, we've got algorithms like PageRank, you know, that can actually be run on a graph, but there's slow iterative things that happen at the end of a data pipeline. Well, with this capability to be able to take results from matching patterns and call back into the graph, um, we can actually run those kind of algorithms and find what is the most important thing in the graph while the data is changing continuously live uh, as the processing goes on. Yeah, I kind of see this as a, a shift from reactive to proactive security. You know, yeah. and, that, and by doing that, and this is really the, the the holy grail, if you will, out there, because everybody's talking about active defense with XDR, quarantining, talking mm -hmm. to modern storage systems with signaling. But it, it, this is a really a good step in that direction because now you're being proactive, and because you are, you're reducing the window of opportunity for the bad actors in nation states, which like you mentioned earlier, they're well-funded. They, they've they probably been sitting in there for a while to, you know, monitoring what's going on, uh, have command and control in place to execute that attack at, at their leisure. So to me, by being able to have this capability gives you that, give, give you that, that extra visibility that's required uh, to, to, especially as we move into the AI uh, AI powered threat world where it's really going to become even more difficult as we've all heard. And, and then, then but my, that leads to my, my second kind of thought and question, uh, Ryan is, you know, when you think about a security incident and this is something we spent a lot of time on, I've done over 111 um, tabletops and I got another one this Thursday for a big college down in Houston. And what we're talking about is trying to reduce the timeline, right? So the, so the, so the loss window shrinks as well. To yep. me, the streaming graph technology provides its detailed real-time insights into how the attack is unfolding, like you showed what was involved and where the vulnerability is in this particular case. You know, it was with an Excel file that, you know, kicked off another thing and, um, and uh, then exfiltrated the data. If you were able to get situational awareness, which is really what you just provided us, that enables it a faster, more effective uh, incident response or remediation. And what are your thoughts on? It, it, am I getting that right on that? Is there is there even more that I'm not that I'm not getting? Yeah, you're right on target. So it's that that ability to to be proactive in your cybersecurity posture. Um, it's been the holy grail, and it's kind of been the missing piece of the puzzle. What what often happens is because because the deep uh, processing needed to produce meaningful answers like this because it uh, requires some kind of offline processing at the end of stream processing systems. What commonly happens is, especially for AI applications, they get deployed in a way that you might be collecting real-time data, but that real-time data then gets batched up and saved somewhere, then used to train an algorithm. Then that trained algorithm comes back and tries to make a prediction. And so you're predicting the future, um, but, uh, but you're trying to look at the current data stream and predict in the current data what's you know what's there. What should I pay attention to? But you're you're using you know AI systems or other algorithms that are trained on old historical data, maybe yesterday's data or last week's data or you know months old data. So it's this old historical stuff, and meanwhile attackers are doing new things. And so correctly making a prediction about the future is pretty hard. And if we take that same pattern and just shift it back in time to try to use past data to predict the present, then we've got all the difficulties of predicting the future. But now we're just trying to, we're kind of on our heels um, in a in a, you know, awkward defensive posture, trying to make a prediction about the present. Um, and it's no wonder that uh, that's, that enterprises and, and the SOCs that monitor their cybersecurity operations are so buried in false positives. And there's such a manpower shortage in this industry. Um, because when you try to apply these kind of offline batch uh, tools for the complex answers we need in this predictive sense on current data, I mean, you're, you might as well be gambling at the casino because making a prediction about the future is hard and time shifting that to use past data to make a prediction about the present is kind of crazy. 
but we had to do it because we couldn't get to deep answers in real time in a stream, at least until now. And so that streaming graph capability gives us this, this new ability to combine old historical data, like whatever used to flow through the stream last week or a month ago, combine that with real time right now and take this proactive posture to defend when you can see pieces of the attacker's puzzle coming together, you can stop them before they get out the door with the crown jewels. Yeah, it's really about... I mean, if you think about the way they do it with the static kind of systems that they're using now, um, it's about early indicators of compromise. If you hope to e even slightly catch up on the timeline, because it, they're they're encrypting at 55,000 files per minute, right? So if you're talking about ransomware, for example, um, and so if that attack's happening, if you're if you don't catch the early indicators of compromise and they hit you at 7:45 on a Friday night and a holiday weekend which is what they typically do, you're going to find yourself in a whole lot of trouble. But if you were able to uh, have this type of capability um, and really kind of have a more holistic security posture, if you will, by continuously monitoring and analyzing the entire data ecosystem like you were showing, you, the comprehensive visibility, it just drives a whole different set of things because now all these interconnected threats and some of the stuff that would have been missed by siloed or you know more static systems um, without that visibility, you know, you could even find yourself in a lot of trouble very, very quickly. In fact, it would move very fast from incident response to business continuity. And probably by the time they found it on Monday, it'd be disaster recovery at that point. Is there is there a way to set up notifications and alerts? I, I know you said, well, here's a notification that I have. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that? Because that 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 along with an early indicator of compromise is a big, big deal. Yeah. So um integrating uh, a streaming graph like this into a data pipeline um, is common practice for a data engineer maybe, but um, uh, you know, seeing the effects of it and kind of you know where that leads uh, to your point is a good question. So options, options for how to turn that answer into something that someone can trigger action from, uh, you know, they include the systems that are already in place. Um, so a lot of environments already have, you know, pieces of the puzzle that solve this for their monitoring and their alerting solution. Um, uh, and so those systems consume from a lot of the typical data pipes like Kafka and Kinesis and that sort of thing. So a streaming graph can publish to those systems and you can use your existing systems already. But sometimes this is a new effort or sometimes this capability really needs to be delivered uh, in other ways. And uh, you see kind of in the in the lower corner on this slide for the integration pieces of the puzzle, it could publish into Slack. So if the team that needs to know about this and take action uh, is waiting in Slack, you can take alerts out of a streaming graph and instantly publish them to Slack so that the right people are notified in the right channel with the right contextual information, with a link that takes them right to where they need to go to understand the uh, the context and what ha what's happening and whether or not they need to take action now. <clears throat> or there's other integration options as well, like HTTP webhooks that can call out to other external systems uh, and actually you know hook into to other alerting systems or or push notifications or text messages. Um, or other alerting systems that can find just the right people and in, and as critically find them at exactly the right moment when they can actually still do something about what's happening. Yeah, I can really see how the Slack and webhook would be very, very valuable because a lot of people are trying to figure out that, you know, you hear about, put it this way, when I go out and talk to the big enterprise customers, they're always talking about visibility. They've got too many consoles, not all of them are being monitored. They don't really have the real-time tools. Uh, everything, like you said, is historical. And it kind of leaves them with, you know, a, a very reactive environment that oftentimes doesn't, uh, that doesn't meet the standard they need, uh, especially once they've determined their RTO and RPO. So it's just one of those things I think, uh, you know, this could be so useful for that piece. Um, you were talking about, you know, data from here and data from here, and especially on this slide. Can you talk a little bit about the, because one of the questions I was thinking in my mind while you were going through the presentation was what about scalability? Um, you know, a lot of times that is a problem for ingestion for some of the systems that you see out there, uh, especially open source systems on that, that where there might be a scalability problem. If you could touch on that, I think that would be really useful. 
Yeah, it's a great point. Like gra graphs have been around for a long time and uh, and the cybersecurity world has really kind of honed in on their effectiveness, but a lot of times has to manually create a lot of the tools to do this. Um, and that's because the graph databases that have been around are really just too slow and can't really scale horizontally. You know, in a lot of cases with the most popular tools, if you add more servers to your graph cluster, it gets slower, not faster. Right. And, and so that's really been kind of the limiting factor for the industry. We know graphs are the key piece of the puzzle for unlocking this. You know, some, some luminaries in the field like John Lambert uh, at Microsoft have even talked about how uh, it's what you need is the graph of graphs to be able to put together, um, you know, your threat intelligence graph, you know, with uh, various data graphs and understand how these things all relate, your asset graph, you know, in your infrastructure, put those pieces together, but that's a lot of data. Um, and especially logs coming from all that data, just it's, you know, it's been far too much to manage. Well, how would you correlate it, right, to that particular point? If you got that yeah. much data, how, how is it being, what's the correlation engine and how does it make any sense? That's why I thought when you showed the demo and the way that that was all correlated really made sense to me. Yeah. So just to get slightly techy here for a little bit here too, the, um, there's, you know, there's the question of why hasn't this been done before? The need's been there. Um, but your question about scale is really the, the key centerpiece here because We've had tools that could do this at toy scales that have shown us that, yeah, that's the right solution. We can prove it on a small data set, but we haven't been able to scale those things to real world enterprise data sets until now. The key capability of that dot streaming graph is that it can scale horizontally to any data volume. And the way that works under the hood, so we're building this graph like we talked about and that we looked at. A graph is so powerful because it can represent literally anything. You have the connections that are front and center, uh, and the graph can represent anything in the, sa in the same way that like subject, predicate, object, and language turns into this node edge node pattern in a graph. But under the hood, the way streaming graph works that's so different than any system that came before it, and what really enables it to scale is that that graph is backed by each little node in the graph is backed by the equivalent of its own little CPU. Each node that we saw when we were looking at Excel and the files that it read and the, the NT clean APT process, each of those, when it's running and processing, it gets its own little CPU, an actor. This is an old idea from the seventies, but it has never really been combined with graphs before uh, that dot streaming graph. And so when those actors are little uh, little CPUs that can trigger action <clears throat> and you can spread them out across a cluster of machines so they work together in concert, they communicate with each other just by sending messages. So one of those nodes in a graph will send a message to another node in the graph. It's triggered by events. So they don't have to do any work unless there's work to do and mm -hmm. work for just that one little unit. And that model of computation is the key piece of the puzzle for how this scales horizontally, um, for how it can process in real time, and the event-driven nature of it. The fact that we only do work when there's work that needs to be done, that's the key piece of the puzzle for scaling uh, a streaming graph like this. Typically, you'd have to collect this data, and if you're storing it in tables, then you have to join one table to another table in order to, to basically hop across one edge in a graph. Well, joining one table means sometimes millions of rows combined with millions of rows over here. How often can you do that? That takes a long time to process through that right. stuff. Um, yeah. And so that, you know, that is the limiting factor uh, in that you can't scale that kind of processing because the more you try to hop across one edge with more and more data, the slower and slower your system gets. So this event-driven model gives us the opportunity to ask kind of a silly question. It's like, why would you spend time checking uh, you know, the rows in a table if they're not a part of the answer that you care about? It's a silly question, but it's like the, you know, the, the answer is, well, because I don't know that you know, they're not the rows that I care about. Um, you know, but here you are thinking in lists, 
we got to join this list over here with that list over there. Um, you know, the graph is the key to unlocking that because the edges in the data tell you what to care about. You don't need to combine a million results from this list or this table with a million results from that one because we've got an edge that connects the relevant things. And the fact that we can work across those edges in this event-driven way and that we can take this model, we can cut along those edges and we can take each node and put them on different servers. That gives us a mechanism for scaling this horizontally to any volume of data and handling any workload, um, regardless of you know the hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of machines in your enterprise environment who are all sending back this EDR data or the network events all sending back network uh, information, you know, or proximity badge scanners and you know all the other pieces of an enterprise uh, data and security, um, combining those things to really get that full XCR picture is now this event-driven, efficient, highly scalable process for the first time. Yeah, and it seems to do it, uh, be, you know, based on what you were showing uh, just a while ago, um, it seems to do that with context, uh, being able to understand with precision and accuracy, the context and relationship between the data points. Like you said, it yeah. doesn't care about the stuff it doesn't care about. <laughs> Um, and it's communicating node to node, right? Based on on the the messaging, and so that get at the high, at the, a couple of level of abstractions back to what you were showing in the demo. Um, it's kind of you know looking through and saying, hey, this is just an anomaly. Uh, this is a threat, and you're so you're the precision and accuracy you have to have to be able to understand whether that was an anomaly or a threat because you actually alluded to it, but you didn't touch it. You didn't go into it that it could be an anomaly. They say these happen all the time, right? These, these kind of, so, but, so you can scale, but you're not losing the precision and accuracy because like you said, a lot of joins, a lot of this stuff, yep. you, you know, you're either going to end up with a slow system or you're going to end up with an inaccurate and not very precise system, yep. uh, with, you know, that ends up being false positives in the security world, et cetera. Is there, is there a kind of a way to think about that that kind of brings it to uh, a kind of a C-level or maybe a, a security engineer level in your mind? Yeah, so where where my head goes on that is really kind of maybe like this. Um, so the data layer oh, comes yeah. from so many different sources down at the bottom of this pyramid here. Um, and the real goal is to get to the top of the pyramid by walking through, uh, exactly like you said, with precision and accuracy, walking through an understanding of, well, what does that data actually mean? Well, you know, some of the data refers to objects that we care about. Some of those objects participate to cause certain events that we care about. Some of those events are part of stages of an attack. And when you can see some of those attacks, then you can flip that bit right at the very top, you can sound the alarm and say, something is wrong, take action. And so when you, you know, when you mentioned kind of rolling up the, you know, to get to a sea level explanation, um, you know, the, the volume of data at the bottom is the challenge. Flipping a bit so that, you know, a CISO knows yes or no, is something wrong? Do I need to pay attention? Do I need to stop the presses and, and protect my enterprise? That's the top level bit. And getting a, a light that turns on is a huge advantage, but it prompts the very next natural question of, okay, the light turned on, the bit got flipped. So there's an attack I need to care about. Now give me the details, now explain it. And that's where we walk back down this, this pyramid um, to understand not just that an attack is happening, but here are the stages, here's how far along it is. Here are the events that participate in this. Each, each of these objects contributes to those events. And if needed, here's the underlying data that lets you track it all the way back. So I think of you know the, the different levels of, of summary and explanation that different roles would have from a C-level down to a data engineer live at different points on this pyramid. Mm -hmm, and the sure. key challenge is putting these pieces together so that you can flip that bit but do it in a way that you can then step back down and get an explanation and take action that is meaningful. Yeah, because I think about it like, 
you know, the real challenge is, you know, further compounded by the time delays inherent in traditional event stream processors, yeah. which can leave, you know, businesses and organizations, they're exposed during that time, right? It's because the critical period is between detection and response. That's the thing we see all the time. Because yeah. if between detection and response, you could find yourself in a whole lot of hurt. But the, the ability that you showed earlier to uh, go in there, do some of the forensics, if you will, um, you know, find out what was real, what's not real, where where it came from, and possibly identify what it is, because that's the first question the FBI asks you when you call them, uh, or yeah. if you call the insurance company. That it's that critical period between detection and response, and what that first response is going to be is going to be dictated by the precision accuracy of that of, of the data or what you've been able to discover. That to me is a real real big element that streaming graph brings to the table that could be unbelievably useful. Yeah. A hundred percent. You're, you're at, yeah. Triggering that action. And especially like knowing what to care about is just the, the big piece of the puzzle. The, I alluded to this earlier uh, and there's probably not enough time to go into any depth here, but just uh, to leave a little pointer um, the second capability uh, that is built on top of streaming graph also addresses what you're talking about. So the on the question of like, how does a C-level exec, how do they know what to care about? Um, right. That's the question resolved by our second product, Novelty. That Novelty piece can plug into a real-time data stream. So consume uh, right away, immediately like we're talking about, and rank everything understand and rank everything that's happening in that data stream, even if we've never seen it before, in context with all the idiosyncrasies involved for each separate uh, group, each person, you know, each uh, organization, the things that are particular to them and kind of make them special, this gets folded into an, a highly contextual understanding of what's happening in the stream and how strange is it, how novel is that activity. So this plot over here on the right is really just kind of a, a, a measure of the data stream as things are coming through in real time, where these yellow guys um, are perfectly unique items we've never seen before. And we can use context to understand when one of those is highly anomalous, gets a high score and shows up at the top of the chart and needs to get the attention of C-level folks immediately, or whether something that is yellow, it's unique, it's still normal because uh, we have enough context to understand that even though it's unique and never seen before, it's common for that. This real-time notification and this total ranking of all the unknown unknowns in a data stream is the next key piece of the puzzle um, for how you evaluate and interpret and roll up that understanding in real time so that you can trigger action at all the right levels of an organization. Yeah, this uh, to me, this was very useful in the fact that the most vulnerable organizations are those with a lot of data and no real-time capability, especially in low latency environments like healthcare, financial services, government, et cetera. Uh, where they're providing real-time services. Um, and then, the, or it's in some type of environment where they don't have enough people to monitor all the data or they don't have the systems to monitor all the data. If they were able to do it through this, where it helps them identify those uh, pieces out of that, that might be, you know, more novel or, or uh, bearing further investigation, if you will. That would be very powerful because that's really where a lot of people are, find themselves in trouble. Because if you go in and talk to an organization, I've never, I've, to this day, I've never heard one organization say they have all the resources they possibly want, right? We have all <laughs> hired all the people we can hire and we're set. That's never the case. So be, being able to do more with less in security yeah. is super valuable. And that, 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 this piece right here uh, brings that capability in my mind at a high level. We we, we had a customer who took a year's worth of their cybersecurity alerts. So the, the alerts that were coming out of all the rest of their systems meant to feed their security operations center, um, took a year's worth of those alerts, uh, over a million alerts that humans had to look at and evaluate. Um, they didn't get to anywhere near looking at that whole set. Uh, so they missed a whole lot of things that were important. 
but they took a year's worth of that data. They fed it into that dot novelty um, and it turned it into this ranking uh, for you know all of those alerts in just a couple of minutes. So a year's worth of data ranked in a couple minutes um, mm -hmm. that can process in real time. Uh, and then their teams took the top 50 uh, from the, that ranked list that came out of uh, that dot novelty. They looked at those top 50 and they said, these are the 50 things we wish we would have found over the last year. You know what, even, even, you know, even in uh, going, looking at the past, that's still useful. Mm -hmm. We tell everybody, you know, for threat hunting, go back, train on your data, find out what your real vulnerabilities yeah. are. But that is amazing. That, that, that's a capability that can bring some real value. And then, then flip it on for your live stream. Mm -hmm. And what it gives you is a real time evaluation for, you know, these thousand alerts that came in that my team has to handle in the next 20 minutes. What should I focus on first and second and third? And how do I know when I'm done? How do I know I can actually go home and safely sleep at night? <laughs> um, you know, that's that's what you get from uh, a novelty evaluation live in your stream is you know what's important with confidence. It's always right. Uh, and you get to focus on only the things that matter. And you can understand with confidence that a huge volume of these alerts can safely, you know, go in the go into cold storage. Yeah, one more one more thing. I know we're running out of time, but if you go out to the traditional AI based data processing pieces that you see, um, especially if it has alerts and notifications, you go back to look at RNA and all these early early ones, right? They were part of Snort, connected to Snort, et cetera. They all took three to four to five months of training off the data coming in before they could make any inferences whatsoever. Uh, yeah. So having the ability to do this quickly and and rapidly with great precision and accuracy is, is a real value. This has been very helpful, Ryan. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And that's our mission. We're trying to push these capabilities earlier in the stream so that there's new tools for defenders uh, to do important things to defend their uh, their enterprise environments. Yeah, and I'm guessing real quick, Ryan, and great questions, Mark. That was incredibly elucidating. This whole session has been fantastic. Yeah, you know, I'm guessing you've got a variety of different algorithms under the hood here. My favorite pet algorithm is always the k-means, uh, basically sorting by disparity. Is that how you're able to come up with the last graph you showed, where you know this is highly anonymous? It's, it, anonymous. it's not just unique; it's just very, very strange. Obviously, that's a combination of factors, right? But can you talk just quickly to the kinds of algorithms that can run in the background to classify and to uh, to reveal? Yeah, there's a there's a lot of them, and the novelty piece in particular, uh, the the way this works, it, it's on top of the streaming graph. We build a graph to represent, especially the categorical data that comes in. So data is roughly speaking, you know, in two two flavors. There's numbers, and there's everything that's not a number. So numbers are what feed machine learning systems, um, but the categorical data is everything else, all the non numeric stuff. So it's like usernames and email addresses and file paths uh, and URLs. It's all that kind of stuff. That's really where the behavioral signal lies. And so what we did through our uh, through the R&D phase of a lot of our work is we developed actually a new algorithm for actually doing graph analysis on categorical data. It's actually uh, to, to analyze the graph uh, for that is built from this real-time stream of categorical data, analyze that graph in ways that can use context, bring in an, uh, and understand all the idiosyncrasies of the data to score uh, every observation in real time and provide an explanation of why it's so unusual. So it's a, uh, you know, the, the details get into a lot of deep math um, but it's a new AI capability that we developed and built on top of the streaming graph uh, and is available for that dot users. And, and you're also tracking the threats. So the example that you gave, once Quine finds this, once that dot identifies this as a malicious pattern, that pattern is then saved and is now automatically, I'm, I'm just guessing here, in a litany of identified troublemaking patterns such that the next time it happens, you know right away. Is that correct? Yeah, all all of that, all those previous patterns inform our understanding 
for evaluating everything else yet to come. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that gives us an, a complete understanding for looking at the next event, whether or not you need to pay attention to the next event is based on a holistic understanding, a fully contextually aware picture of everything that has come before it. Yeah, that's that's amazing. And I think you did touch on this, but last last comment here, we're going a little bit over time, but you commented on this, I think a little bit, but maybe just to expound, anything, any new data elements can come in and it will fit in this environment, right? As opposed to having someone be required to build out a new schema or a new map, for example, any anomaly that comes across the transom can now be represented really instantaneously. Is that right, Ryan? Yeah, that's exactly right. That's the power of the graph under the hood is it's that flexible model that mm -hmm. can be extended. It can grow. It can handle unseen events. And in the cybersecurity world, that's mostly the problem. <laughs> you know, we want to know about these things we didn't know to pay attention to in the first place. Right. Yeah, it's and interesting. So the what we what we're seeing is the uh, most uh, mid to large size environments have three to five times more unstructured data than structured data, and that mm -hmm. unstructured data is where a lot of the threats, a lot of the vulnerability lies uh, for those environments. And we're starting to see where they're using data classification, these other type of things to try to do that. But this would be great because it sounds like you can take both the structured and the unstructured data in, in here. Yeah. Well, our mission at that dot is to understand data immediately. And we we empower our, our users who are often cybersecurity providers to actually do exactly that inside their products, inside their systems. Um, so that they can deliver that last mile of capability to end users in the enterprise environment. And uh, yeah, we want to, when we put the pieces together, um, I'm optimistic for the future of cybersecurity. Yeah. And I'll, maybe I'll just throw one last question at both of you, Mark, you first, and then Ryan, you know, as we all look at this tremendous power of generative AI, the ability to mimic someone's face, the ability to mimic someone's voice, the ability to mimic someone's behavior. I mean, these are tremendous assets in the hands of the bad guys. And to me, this this solution, this streaming graph is coming really just in time to, to help us deal with that because that's yeah. a tremendous threat. What do you think real quick, Mark? No, it is. In fact, I think the vast majority of the... Um, you know, customers out there, uh, the end customer, as well as almost all the cybersecurity providers uh, of which we work with, um, every one of them is trying to figure out novel, interesting, uh, you know, more accurate ways to determine if AI is involved, what has it done, deep fakes, uh, you know, even copying the writing style on an email that they send to uh, accounts payable to tell them to go ahead and pay that right, right. now, wiring. <laughs> Um, you know, you see these kind of things. These are all happening right now as we speak. And and anything that will help identify those, especially in the way that Ryan showed earlier, where it's more real time, it's more proactive than reactive. That's going to have tremendous value. Yeah. Final thoughts from you, Ryan. Go ahead. You know, there's an old adage. If you only do what you ever did, you only get what you ever got. <laughs> um, <I love it. laughs> and you know, we're we're bringing a new capability to this space, and it's kind of wild what you can do with this. The cybersecurity landscape has sat for decades as the kind of place where the defender has to be perfect and the attacker only has to find a single flaw. These capabilities let us start to see the world from the opposite angle, where the attacker has to be absolutely perfect and do nothing out of the ordinary to stay hidden. Um, and we can see in real time with automated signals, as soon as they step out of line, as soon as they do anything out of the ordinary, we can understand it with confidence. That's yeah, because the they're, they're actually in. hiding in mountain, to your, your point, most environments they're hiding in, they're, what they're doing on purpose is going low and slow, hiding in mountains of data. That's what, we're, that, mm -hmm. that's what we see a lot of time, the new attack profiles and the attack vectors, they come in, they sit there for an average of 242 days. Uh, in some in some cases and they're going low and slow so they don't get they don't they don't you know show up as an anomaly or an issue to be investigated and they hide in that mountains of data and they assume um and and they find out very quickly that they don't the 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 company that they've infiltrated 
doesn't have the capability to monitor or manage them. Now they can watch and see what the value of the data is. Where can they go east and west? Can they get privileged accounts? I mean, it's a big deal to be able to do this. I think I think one of the things a lot of people don't get is if we don't get to this real time, uh, low latency approach, we're we're going to be in trouble. Yep. Wow, well what a fantastic show today! Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Paige, Robert, and the whole team from that dot and all of our attendees. We do archive all these webinars for later viewing, so you can go to the same URL. Thank you, Zoom. Excellent architectural decision on your on your part. The uh, the URL before the event is the same after the event. And with that, we'll bid you farewell. Thanks again, folks. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.